It's been said that jogging is like banging your head against the wall because it feels so good when you stop. <laughs> I learned the truth of that when I was in my teenage years. My father was a lifelong exercise man, always exercising. For years, when I was young, all the way up into my adult life, he jogged and he walked and he was outdoors regularly. And so when I was in my teenage years, I think he wanted me to learn the same disciplines. And so he would come in and wake me up in the mornings. I still remember that. He would wake me up at a time that in my teenage years seemed like an unearthly hour. Be in there saying, Rand, come on, get up, let's go, let's hit the road. And I'd be like, oh, Dad, please. He says, no, 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 come on, come on. So out we would go. And I still remember those runs. He would take off down the road, and I would follow as far behind as I dared, praying that the agony would end, <laughs> hoping that he would turn around, because I knew as far as we went, we were going to have to come back that same distance. So please turn around. Here's the irony of that. The irony of that is I continue to do the same thing today. All these years later, I not only do it, I look forward to doing it. I enjoy doing it, and I miss it when I don't do it. Tremendous irony in that habit that my father helped create in me so many years ago. We're in a series called Holy Habits. You may have noticed the subtitle to the series, CrossFit Training for Disciples. Now, I want to be honest with you right up front. I have not done CrossFit training. I have done boot camp, but God gave me the victory over that. <laughs> so I haven't done CrossFit, but I've been learning about it, learning about what it is, what it means, and what people do who are doing CrossFit training. And I've learned that there are certain regimens in which you engage if you're doing CrossFit. One of the ones that captured my attention because I knew we were going to be talking about today's topic was one called active recovery. Now, I suppose we have CrossFit training people throughout this congregation, so you know this better than do I. But active recovery is this. It's those days when you're not engaged in the aggressive, the high aerobic, high intensity, high impact exercises, but nor are they rest days. They're not days when you lie down on the couch and watch TV or sit in the easy chair, not those kinds of days. Active recovery are days when you aren't doing the high impact, but you are doing action activity of some kind. It's at a much lower level. It may be a gentle swim or a slow cycling or a walk that is long but not intense. So you're still being active. You're still doing something, but you've backed off the high energy aspect of CrossFit. That's what I'd like to talk about today, active recovery in the spiritual world. It's an activity that we still are participating in the spiritual life, but it's not a more high-energy, high-impact activity like service that demands that you get up and you go out there and you stretch your faith and you open your heart and you broaden your boundaries. This one, rather, is lower, quieter. It's called solitude and silence. Now, I can imagine that one of the first questions someone might ask about holy habits is this. Why are we doing it? Why are we engaged in this? The answer really is very simple. We engage in holy habits in order to grow. It's the same kind of thing that happens in the physical world. We engage in exercise. My dad used to go out and jog. I still go out and walk or exercise in some form because I want to somehow affect my physical and my mental life. It's the same with you. We do the same thing with our holy habits. It's because we desire to grow, grow toward maturity in Christ. I listened to a preacher some time ago talking to preachers. I was in the, in the congregation. This preacher spoke to us, and he said this. He said, I believe that most of the people to whom you preach every week are terrified by one idea. Well, that'll catch a preacher's attention. What is it that terrifies the people to whom I preach? He said this. Most of the people to whom we preach are terrified by the idea that this is as good as it's ever going to get. Doesn't get any better from here. 
In other words, he says, think about your marriage as it exists right now with its difficulties and its blessings, its distance and its conflict and its closeness, all that makes up your marriage. He said, think about that and say, this is as good as it gets. Never going to get any better. For some people, they say, great. But for many others, it extinguishes the hope of growth. Or think about your job. Suppose I were to tell you about your job today as you know it. Same boss, same work environment, same demands. This is as good as it's going to get. Never going to get any better. The preacher who spoke to us said, that terrifies most people. Or think about your character as it stands today. You know how we like to think and dream and hope and pray, God, make me more patient, make me more kind, make me more loving, make me more pure, all those things. Well, what if today I said to you today, this is as good as it gets, nothing any better. That preacher that day said that terrifies us because we want to grow. We want to change. We want life transformation. That right there is the purpose of holy habits. Holy habits require our engagement, our energy, our effort to change. Now, I can imagine that upon hearing that, somebody will say to me, wait, 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 wait. that sounds like legalism, Randy. Not at all. Salvation, a free gift. Utterly, completely, totally free, available to you simply by accepting it by faith in Jesus, and that's yours. That's salvation. Growth, effort, energy, investment. It's not to heaven in an easy chair. We grow because we invest ourselves in the same way that you do when you're running down the road jogging. Every week in our Tuesday morning staff meeting, we, we have a time in our staff meeting as we pastors sit around the table, a time when we talk about discipleship, this, this reality in which we are so deeply engaged and upon which we are so clearly focused. This last week, we were talking about discipleship, thinking, reading, praying about it, when Pastor Tyler, our young adult pastor, read us a quote. It was one that really caught my attention. I want to read to you what Tyler read to us this last Tuesday. It comes from Dallas Willard, the author, the writer that many of you are familiar with. This is what he says about these very things. We have been taught, says Willard, that grace means you can do nothing to be saved. Such thinking has been extended to you can do nothing to have spiritual growth. So spiritual transformation occurs, according to this thinking, in one of two ways, inspiration or information. Inspiration means that in one golden moment, one great experience, you will be transformed. I don't want to criticize experience. I've had many wonderful experiences with God, but they don't transform you. The other view, information, is the means whereby you pour truth into your head and suddenly you are transformed. Inspiration isn't going to do it, and information isn't going to do it. The only way human character is transformed with grace is by discipline and activity. That is the purpose for holy habits. Pastor Joy kicked us off in an exceptional way, talking about the holy habit of submission. Pastor Roy continued in an exceptional way, talking about the holy habit of engaging with Scripture. Now today we turn our thoughts towards solitude and silence. Another key holy habit. We've been there before years ago, but we have to go back to 1 Kings 19. I would suggest to you that 1 Kings 19 is the ground zero in any conversation about solitude and silence in the spiritual journey with Jesus. We're going to join Elijah midstream. We join him at a moment in time where he has experienced an incredible high. He's been on the mountaintop, on the top of Carmel, facing down the prophets of Baal. It's been a dramatic experience that has occurred. Elijah has said, let the God who answers by fire, let that one be the true God. And in response to his 
plea and his prayer. Simple as it was, the fire flashed from the sky and consumed the altar and everything on it. The next events were rapid ones. As he left the mountain, the smoke still lingered in the air. The stream was still reddened by the blood of the prophets who had faced him. And the rain was beginning to fall. He grabbed the king's chariot horses and outran them 20 miles back to Jezreel. You talk about being on a spiritual high. He arrives in the midst of a rainstorm like no other. The king goes into the palace, and Elijah collapses, apparently under some kind of shelter, to sleep. A well-deserved rest. But it doesn't last long. Somebody shakes him awake. Shakes him awake with news that will catapult him into a chasm of despair. That's where we join Elijah in 1 Kings 19. I begin reading with verse 1. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like one of them. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the tree and fell asleep. All at once an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Oreb, the mountain of God. Then he went into a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. What are you doing here, Elijah? The voice said to him. He replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have, Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I'm the only one left, and they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said to him, Go. And there follows a new mission for Elijah. You can't blame him. You can't blame him for descending into despair, for hunkering back into the darkness of the cave. He has invested his life in reform. And reform finally happened right before his eyes. There they were, the people of Israel, faces in the dirt, chanting, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Finally, they were repenting. They were turning back. Finally, God would have his place in the nation of Israel. And then the message. The message from Jezebel, which between the lines said, you thought things were going to change? You thought your God is now in control? 
you thought I was going away? Think again. I'm still here. And furthermore, I'm going to end your life as you ended theirs. And that's enough. Forty days of flight through a barren, desolate wilderness until he comes to Orb, more commonly known as Sinai, the mountain of God, and disappears into a cave, hiding himself from all outside light. There are many things Elijah might know at this point in time. But there's one thing he doesn't realize. He doesn't realize that hunkered down in the cave, cut off from the outside light, from outside contact, he doesn't realize that he hovers between two great eras in Israelite history. He's the dividing line. He's the crease in the book telling the story. You see, before this time, there was a way in which God revealed himself to people. There was a way in which people encountered God, and that way was this. There were grand and mighty epiphanies, great appearances of God, majestic and terrible in nature. Didn't seem to matter where he revealed himself. You could be hovering behind the bushes with the people of Israel as Moses faces Mount Sinai and God descends and the mountain shakes, rattles, and rolls, and you are crying out in fear because of the holiness of the God before you. Or it could be that you're hiding in your tent, peering out as you see the earth open and swallow up the likes of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, and anybody else who dares to come near. Or you could be hovering with the friends of Job or with Job himself, who suddenly, out of the whirlwind, hears the voice of God come speaking to him. Truth is, it doesn't much matter. The way God has revealed himself time and again is through the grand and the glorious. It was an awesome, frightful thing to encounter God. Even Elijah. Think about his life. Dramatic? Please. Steps onto the center stage of Israelite history and says, There will be no rain until I say, boom, and the heavens become brass. Steps into the room of a dead child, says, Stand up and live, and the muscles that were stiffened by rigor mortis moments before suddenly flex with life. Stands on the mountaintop toe-to-toe with 450 prophets, the God who answers by fire, and a fiery holocaust flashes from the sky and consumes, obliterates the altar and everything on it. Talk about dramatic. That's Elijah's world. That's the way in which God has often revealed himself up to this moment in the cave. Elijah has lost touch with God. That one message was enough to send him into the darkness. We've all been there at some point. That point where we're trying to reconnect with God, trying to find a way that we can hear him, that we can sense his presence with us. That's where Elijah is. And so when he realizes, I've got to reconnect with God, he knows there is one place I must go. I must go back to Sinai, to Oreb, to the mountain of God. I must get back in touch with that grand and glorious God of the galaxies. I have to find him again. Hear from him again. Experience him again. And that's how God reveals himself. In the grand and the mighty. And so here he is. In the cave. Waiting. For God to again reveal himself. You read the text. 
The fire burned. The earth quaked. The wind blew. All manners in which God had revealed himself before. Some even in the life of Elijah. But you read the text. With each dramatic occurrence, it says, and God was not in it. He's looking for in, in, in inspiration. God is not in it. And then as the smoke is blown away, as the dust settles, as he feels for stability in the earth beneath him, a dead calm descends on the mountain. Not a whisper. Not a breath of air. Nothing moves. And in that stillness, says the text, Elijah heard the voice of God. And the text says, he wrapped his face in his mantle and came out of the cave to stand in the presence of God. It's a change. Because do you realize that after this, only rarely will God reveal himself in the grand and the dramatic. Instead, you heard the scripture passages read today so well by the Hunleys. You remember those verses, all of which come after Elijah. Be still and know that I am God. In quietness and confidence will be your strength. Or what about the life and ministry of Jesus? Rising early in the morning, a great while before day, he went to a solitary place and there prayed in another place in the Gospels. And he went out and spent the entire night in prayer to God. And yet another place. He withdrew into a solitary place and prayed all night. And after that, he chose his disciples. Or even the words of Habakkuk. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent. It's a shift. When Elijah had gone back to Sinai, he was going back to the place where he knew Moses had experienced God. He was going back to that place where Moses had ripped off his sandals to stand trembling on holy ground. Going to the place where God had said to Moses, I'll reveal to you my glory, but you can't see my face because no one will see it and live. I will hide you in the cleft of the rock. You can see me from behind after I've passed by. That's the God I want to see, he said. Instead, he got solitude, silence, and the still small voice. Do you realize that the next time somebody will see the face of God after Moses saw his back is in a quiet stable, a crying baby, a wondering mother, and a wondering stepfather gaze into the face of God. No earthquake, no smoke, no fire. In fact, where is everybody? There's nobody even here. We thought this was... Wow. Things have changed. Not just in the life of Elijah, but in the lives of the people of God. We've often wished for greater inspiration. 
God, come down and shake Mount Gorgonio a bit. We'll believe. We'll be inspired. But we got too much noise. We're too busy. Spend other time listening. So what does it all mean? For those of us who want to engage in holy habits of growth, what does silence and solitude offer us? I want to give you three suggestions. These are important in my own life. Maybe they might mean something in yours. Three suggestions that I want to encourage you to consider, to contemplate, and if appropriate, to put into practice. Here's number one. Make solitude and silence with God your first morning act. Make solitude and silence with God your first morning act. What do you do when you first get up in the morning? As soon as you wake up, what do you do? We do different kinds of things. I understand that. Some stagger down the hallway to the kitchen to get a cup of artificial energy. Others stagger to the shower thinking his hot water will revive me somehow. Others taunt, turn on the TV to make sure whether or not California's fallen into the ocean overnight. But there's one thing that I venture to guess many of us do. Many of us do. And that is those early mor morning moments, we reach across to the bedside stand and we grab our smartphone. And we begin a day of constant connectivity. We start hearing the angry, strident voices of our society. We start looking at the sports scores, what's happening in fantasy football. We start trying to see what the latest news out of Washington is. We try to see what emails have come overnight to stir up our workday so that by the time we're done with that, our hearts are racing, pounding, we're mad. What's going to happen today? I want to lay down a challenge to you. It's a challenge that I've given myself. I haven't been perfect, but it's growth. And that is this. Make solitude and silent, your silence with God, your first morning act. Let the smartphone lie idle. Let the TV be turned off. Slip instead to your knees, to your prayer closet, to your garden. And in the stillness and in the quiet, contemplate, meditate on the Word of God and on the acts and heart and will of God as revealed in Scripture. Begin your day that way. That's my first suggestion. If you would make this holy habit a part of your life, make solitude and silence with God your first morning act. Second suggestion. Make solitude and silence with God an ongoing pact. Make solitude and silence with God an ongoing pact. In other words, don't just do it tomorrow morning, but do it Monday morning. And then do it Tuesday morning and Wednesday morning and next week and next month. And, and maybe you will find that you have a covenanted time with God that every morning we will meet in this place, in this cave, if you will, where every other voice is hushed, every other sound is stilled. And I open the word and open my heart and ask that you might live in me. Why is that important? I read to you the words of John Ortberg as he writes about these things where he says, wise followers of Christ have always understood solitude to be the foundational practice. Jesus engaged in it frequently, but what makes it so important? Solitude is the one place where we gain freedom from the forces of societies that, society that otherwise relentlessly mold us. It is, in one old phrase, the furnace of transformation. I want to reread one sentence from that. 
Solitude is the one place where we gain freedom from the forces of society that otherwise relentlessly mold us. We are molded by forces around us in society all the time, on every hand. Several years ago, I was driving home, and on a whim, I stopped in Redlands. High school football game was going on. And I stopped and walked in and started to watch. Had no idea who was playing, who was playing against who, who the people on the field were. Had no idea about anybody. But the crowd was cheering. Do you know that within 10 minutes I was cheering? Cheering and shouting. And I thought, what is wrong with you? You don't even know who these people are. You don't even know who these teams are. And here I am cheering for them. I may have been cheering for the wrong side. Those forces can mold us into their image. Solitude before God removes us from that crush and allows the Spirit to work in our hearts and our lives as he did with Elijah. Elijah was given a new mission at the mouth of the cave. Three suggestions. Make silent, solitude and silence before God your first morning act. Second, make solitude and silence before God an ongoing pact. And third, make silence and solitude before God a disciplined fact. A disciplined fact. Now, you may say to me, wait a minute, Ray, why are you using the word like discipline? Discipline fact. That to me sounds hard. That sounds like work. That sounds like jogging. That sounds like legalism. Please. You're not disciplined to earn it or to deserve it or to merit it. Salvation is always a free gift. The discipline comes in putting holy habits to work so that we might grow to maturity in Christ. It's not an easy thing. Discipline is never easy. Because we want to go with the flow. We want to do the easier thing. Take the path of least resistance. This requires discipline. It's underlined by some words from Dr. Archibald Hart. Dr. Hart, former dean of the School of Psychology at Fuller Theological Seminary. Listen to what Dr. Hart writes. A constant state of adrenaline arousal, although physically damaging, is often experienced as pleasant excitement and stimulation. Just think the last time you had the adrenaline surging through your veins at a football game or at a concert or some moment when you could feel it. It may not be good for you, but he says it feels like pleasant excitement and stimulation. And it is this that makes it most dangerous. Because we can come to think of the arousal state as normal and to depend on the high it gives to get anything accomplished. I believe there is a corresponding spiritual danger. Becoming dependent on adrenaline arousal for the good feelings of life can create an association between spirituality and high arousal. In other words, one doesn't feel spiritual unless one is being stimulated by adrenaline arousal. Many expressions of spirituality have become linked to adrenaline arousal, and this can be very harmful. A great many of the true saints of God have found their peak spiritual experiences in quietness and solitude, but many modern saints look for it only in exciting challenges or emotional catharsis. Don't misunderstand. I love inspiring experiences. I love, we had one of those here during our camp meeting series. If you were here that night when we came and we sat and we listened to Veritas sing, were you here? I staggered out of this place on a high. It was unbelievable. I love moments like that. But what Hart is saying is you cannot depend on that. In fact, it can even be damaging. Because you can come to think that it's only when I have a high like that that I'm truly spiritual. When the truth is, God invites us to the discipline of daily devotion before him, before his word, in prayer, regardless of how it feels. 
Elijah points from the cave. And he points toward the presence of God in solitude and silence. Just three suggestions. If you would engage in this holy habit, make solitude and silence with God your first morning act. Make solitude and silence with God an ongoing pact. Make solitude and silence with God a disciplined fact. I close with the prayer of Sir Paul Reeves. God, grant me to be silent before you that I may hear you, at rest in you, that you may work in me, open to you, that you may enter, empty before you, that you may fill me. Let me be still and know you are my God. Amen.